glad to meet you and to welcome you at the marathon dedicated to memory study. Thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to ask you, what do you think about memory study itself? You mean as an academic discipline? Yes. Well, first of all, it's extraordinarily broad. Historians habitually distinguish between, as you know, um, the study of history, which is the study of um, the past as it is commemorated in traces, which can be textual traces, they can be documents, they can be physical traces. Um, whereas memory studies is a more subjective field. It is about the psychology of the either individual or collective commemoration of the past. So memory studies could mean what an individual takes from the past. It could also mean something which is not even conscious, which is, for example, um, forms of commemoration which are collective in the forms of monuments or museums um, or even the names of streets. So memory is an extremely, memory studies is an extremely broad discipline. Um, and in the history of science, which happens to be my discipline, um, memory is perhaps most vividly present in oral interviews, oral history with scientists about their experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your answer. How do you think which problem of objectivity do exist today in the scientific world? The first, of course, is that the very idea of memory studies, as opposed to the study of history, is one which includes not only that which can be documented, and as I say, documented by a wide array of evidence. The evidence might be archaeological, um, it might be geographic, it might be documentary. Whereas memory studies necessarily and intentionally includes an element of the subjective. That is, we are interested not only in what happened in the past, but in how people feel about what happened in the past, and in many cases, how they have reconstructed not just events, snapshot events in the past, but also a narrative. All of those elements, interpretation, selectivity, feeling, narrative, all of those stand opposed to certain ideals of objectivity. Thank you very much for your answer. Tell me please, how do you think, what can be the parameters of this objectivity? The parameters amongst historians are many. Um, and those include um, cross-checking of sources, um, they include Quellen critique. Quellen critique is um, a method that was developed by 19th century historians to try to discover from the sources which have survived for us, from what perspective they were written, what historical context they are embedded in them, and to read them, as one says, against the grain. That is, rather than to accept the narrative at face value in one's sources, one reads them critically from the standpoint of all of, one might say, the illusions of memory which might cloud an objective, impartial record of events. This is not the whole of history. History also depends upon interpretation. But all historians would agree that the starting point, if not the end point of history, is securing evidence. That perhaps is the point at which objectivity intersects with history, the scholarly study of history. With memory studies, I would be, as I wrote to your colleague, I am not an expert in memory studies, but I imagine that objectivity is a much more difficult and perhaps not even a desirable desideratum for memory studies. If the aim of memory studies is not to capture what actually happened in the past, but rather about how the past has been enlisted emotionally, politically, um, communally 
in various causes, from the construction of an autobiography to the construction of a national myth, then one wonders whether it makes sense to talk about objectivity in the context of memory studies. Professor Dustin, I have another one question. We know about studies of Freud and Carl Gustav Jung of the unconsciousness. How do you think, how is it related to memory? I personally, I think it's utter nonsense. Um, I think there are unconscious memories, but they are unlikely to be in the form of Jungian archetypes. I think that the unconscious memories are the memories of the body. Those are the memories of a pianist knowing where to place her fingers on a piano, or more mundanely, um, riding a bicycle, or the cultural memories um, of knowing exactly how to navigate um, crossing a street in a certain culture. Those are unconscious memories, but they bear no resemblance to the Oedipus complex or to Jungian archetypes. Thank you very much for your answer. How do you think, uh, why today so many opinions and controversials about memory? I think one reason why there is so much attention from different disciplinary perspectives on this one object of inquiry, memory, is because at least since the 17th century, memory has been essential to our conceptualization of what it means to have a self. Um, John Locke, in his essay concerning human understanding, went so far as to suggest that when we're asleep, when we're no longer in a position to remember, um, we, we no longer are ourselves. So memory is attractive as an object of inquiry and therefore as an object of controversy by many disciplines because the stakes are so high. Um, it is seen as the key to the self. And you see this conversely in the discussions about dementia and senility, um, surely diseases like Alzheimer's are terrible diseases, but the amount of attention currently given to these forms of senility as disorders of memory or loss of memory is, I think, quite unique to our times and suggests the centrality of memory as an object of inquiry. Um, in terms of the kind of disciplinary cacophony that you described, in which the neuropsychologists talk about memory in one sense, the, um, the historians in another way, the um, cultural um, scholars in another, I think that's inevitable whenever you have an object of great interest. It's rather like the child. Um, there are many different sciences of the child, which is simply testimony to the fact that the child is of central importance in modern societies. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't imagine a cure for this anytime soon, this kind of disciplinary cacophony that you describe. The memory is a very wide category. Different scientists explain memory from different points of view. Different disciplines, they explain it from different points of view. Uh, neuropsychology, neurobiology, cognitive psychology and many others. Uh, what do you think about it? So, I would need to know more about what you mean by categories. Can you give me an example? When I say it by categories, I talk about complex notions, for example, as memory, soul, human spirit and psyche, because many scientists have different notions for psyche. I see, right, okay. So this is a very broad control of memory as the key to the self, the psyche, Um, and the soul. Um, Certainly, there are some methods for exploring memory um, which at least qualify as scientific in the sense that they can be repeated um, and they can be collectively evaluated. One thinks of the very interesting experiments done by the Cambridge psychologist Frederick Bartlett in the 1920s about memory um, or the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky um, and um, Luria, Salvatore Luria on the mind of a nemesis. So these are studies um, 
in which subjects are asked, are told a story, and often a very complicated story, a story that's unfamiliar to them and which has an unfamiliar narrative structure as well. And they are asked at regular intervals to repeat this story um, at, after a week, after two weeks, after a month, after three months. And then what is observed is what details are faithfully remembered from the original story and which disappear and what happens to the narrative structure in the course of time. And there are certain well-attested effects. So for example, if there's a particularly vivid, striking, but peculiar detail, a ghost perhaps, um, or a scarlet flag, um, those details often persist over months and months, long after the subject of the experiments has forgotten everything else, including the narrative of the story. So there are, there are methods of investigating the way in which we remember um, in ways which I say can and have been replicated. Professor Dustin, I would like to ask you maybe a little bit personal question. Talking about white categories as a memory, uh, we can do researches in two manners. One is choose the discipline and look at the problem from the point of view of this discipline. And the another one, it is collaboration between disciplines. When many scientists from different disciplines communicate with each other and they look on the problem from, from different disciplines and after they collaborate with each other and they share their ideas to become to the complex result. What do you personally prefer as a scientist? Both. Both. Why? <laughs> I mean, I can't understand how you could do one without the other. There's no way to do the panoramic version that you described, the integration of several disciplines, unless you can appreciate what the results are first time from a specialist study in at least one discipline. So I can't see how they could work in isolation. I think you would have to do both. Professor Dustin, tell me please, how do you personally think what is the term of memory? In your opinion, what memory is? You mean how to make the term more precise? Yes. Um, I can only think about it, doing it in a fairly artificial way, um, which is what is called in philosophy to operationalize it. That is to say, for example, I'm not recommending this, but for example, to say, what memory is, is the ability to recall um, a string of numbers uh, at least a half hour after they have been repeated to you. Those are the kinds of operational definitions that, for example, cognitive psychologists have often used. But that would strike, I think, most of us as both an artificial and very narrow definition of memory. Um, I suspect that scientists, including the psychologists who might propose such a definition, who would not be interested in memory if that's all it was. I don't think that there is any way around the fact that memory is one of those terms, and there are quite a few in every language, which are many layered. And their interest is exactly because they're polysemous, they have many meanings and a very broad semantic field of associations. So although one certainly can make operational definitions, and scientists and scholars do it all the time, I think that would be the equivalent of uh, killing the goose that laid the golden eggs. Can you recommend something to the scientists, uh, young scientists, in their activity, in their researches? What you can recommend? I have only one piece of advice, which is um, follow what interests you most. Try not to succumb to the temptation um, to research the topic of the hour, the modish topic of the hour. Um, trust your own instincts and your own tastes as to what is an important topic. Thank you very much that you found the time and I hope this is not our last conversation. You too, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.